chapter 10, verse 5. Proverbs 10, 5. A white youth harvests in the summer, but one who sleeps during harvest is a disgrace. I will read it again. A white youth harvests in the summer, but one who sleeps during, his, uh, during harvest is a disgrace. May the Lord bless the reading. I want to say something very, very important before I begin today. You know, I get so busy and rushed at the beginning during announcement time. I, I'm going to say this, and I hope it comes out right. En kwan dehena matachu. How many understands what I just said? Oh, some do. Good. Okay. En kwan dehena matachu. I just know it means welcome. <laughs> We're glad you're here in Amharic. And I met some uh, people for the first time today who are here from Ethiopia. And uh, for the first time, and I wanted to say that especially on your behalf, I want to say welcome. But there are others here today too that I don't think I have a chance to meet yet. And I want to welcome all of you. We're so glad you're here, especially on the fact that on a day, man, it's just pouring down outside still. I mean, you guys could have stayed in and stayed dry and been anywhere else, but you chose to come today to worship. And God's got blessings in store for us today. I really believe that. I hope you do too. Before we get to the scripture verse, though, for today, let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray you would pour out your blessings upon us from your word. Encourage us, Lord. Draw us closer to Jesus is our prayer in his name. Amen. Okay, you see the scripture passage here. Hello? He that, he that gathers in summer is a wise son. He that sleeps in harvest is a son that causes shame. In other words, there's something that's not right about sleeping when the harvest is ready to bring in, right? If the crop, if, whether, whether it's produce or whether it's grain, whatever the harvest is, if it's on the vine and it's ripe and it's ready to come in, oh no, I, I'm so too tired, I'm going to go to sleep. I don't care about that. There's something wrong with that, isn't there? And then the next thing you know, the harvest rots and it goes to waste and it benefits nobody and it's lost. Listen, if there's ever a time when this passage of scripture needs to sink into the hearts and minds of believing Christians, Adventist believing Christians who know that the time of Jesus' return is near, even at the doors, this passage of Scripture applies. In fact, it leads right into the next passage of Scripture. Look what it says here in Romans 13, 11, and 12. Knowing the time. If you're an Adventist Christian, you know the time. You see the signs of the times. You know that Jesus' coming is near even at the doors, knowing the time that now it is high time. People say, what time is it? It's high time, according to Scripture. It's now high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. If there is ever a time to be a part of the harvest work, it's now. And it's no coincidence that we're talking about this now. You know, you heard the announcement at the beginning. We have Bible workers coming. We have cards that we've mailed out. People are getting those cards. They're sending them in. They're saying, yes, I would like to have Bible lessons. It's God giving them an opportunity to hear and understand his last day warning message that helps to dispel the deception. Did you know there's a deception in the world? You know there's a deception in the Christian world today to cause people to not understand the issues at the end time so that they will not be prepared for the coming of Jesus. Satan is no dummy. It's real. And it's now. And God says, if there's ever a time for my people when they understand the last day issues of the time to warn the world with God's last day message, it's now. It's high time. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. And so it leads me to this question. It's a well-known question. 
Politicians have used these questions. Obama used this. Ronald Reagan used this phrase. So too did John F. Kennedy. We usually attribute this, this saying to the politicians, but it, it goes way back, long before the, the recent politicians used this phrase, it goes back to Pliny the Elder, who was a well-known Jewish rabbi in the first century B.C. And it just simply says this, If not us, then who? If not now, then when? If it's not us that's going to be a part of going out with the work with Jesus in the fields of harvest, then who's going to do it? And if it's not now, then when is the right time to do it? If not us, who? If not now, when? A few weeks ago, we looked at Luke chapter 10. We looked at three points in this chapter, Luke chapter 10. Today we're going to look at, look at some more points from Luke 10. In Luke 10, we saw three, week, three four weeks ago when Jesus uh, sent out the 70. He sends out 70 disciples, two by two, 35 groups. And he sends them out to prepare the way to the cities in which he was about to come in hopes of having a harvest. He sent them out ahead of him into the fields of harvest for, pre to prepare the people for his coming. And you can see how that applies to us today, right? Very simple. But the 70 that he sends out two by two, he commissions them to do the exact same work that he had commissioned earlier to the 12. The 12 disciples, and now he says to the 70, I want you to go and do the exact same work that I told the 12 to do. And we looked at these three points a few weeks ago. When we go into the fields of harvest, number one, we find that the work is all-inclusive. There's a work for everybody to do. We find that the work is scary. I'm going to send you out like sheep in the midst of wolves. That's scary. And we find that the work is doable. That's what we looked at a few weeks ago. Today we're going to pick it up where we left off. And we're going to look at the first point for today here in Luke chapter 10 and verse 5. But again... We're coming back to the time of the end, the harvest. Today it's harvest time. It's harvest time now, more so than ever before. Maybe there's some here today, maybe there's some here today that you're, you're not ready to go into the fields of harvest. You're, you're ready to still come to a point of how to have a saving relationship with Jesus for yourself, then that's fine. You need to do that. You need, if, if you're in that category, I, I want to make sure that I'm preaching to, either to the choir or to those who may not apply to the harvest scenario. Maybe you're at the point in your time here today where you're thinking, I'm just thinking, do, do I want to come to Jesus? I'm just trying to, to get grips in my life to understand, is, is this a decision that I need to make? How do I have a relationship with Jesus? If you're in that group today, I want you to know, I want you to understand from Luke chapter 10 today, the effort that all heaven is going through to bring you to a saving relationship to Jesus. The work that all heaven is so intent upon that it's trying to encourage the followers of Jesus now on planet earth to be a part of that work too, just so that you could come to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what this is all about. That's what the work of the harvest is about. And I'll say this before we get into Luke chapter 10. The vast majority of the workers for the harvest are still out there. They have not yet come to that point of accepting Jesus in their lives yet. But when they do, guess what they do? They become workers in the harvest too. They understand, you know what? Jesus has done something for me in my life. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Thank you for accepting me. Thank you for the robe of your righteousness. Thank you for the assurance of eternal life that you give freely. Thank you for dying for my sins on the cross. I accept that by faith. Thank you, Lord. Lord, is there someone that you can use me to help encourage to make the same decision? Do you see the importance of the harvest? The importance of the harvest is not just for the workers to go into the harvest. It's for the people who are harvested. They too now have a desire to want to share what they know about the love of God too. But today it's high time. High time now more than ever before. If you have that saving relationship with Jesus to know that the work is all inclusive in the harvest, there's something God wants to use you to do in helping others know the greatness of his love. So with all that said and done, let's go back to Luke chapter 10 
And let's look and see some more principles that we find here about the work of the harvest. Luke 10, verse 5, And into whatsoever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. Okay? What's the principle that we're going to look at here? The work is peaceable. Peace be to this house. Why did Jesus say this? Why should we say that? Jesus said, when you enter into the, somebody's house out there in the fields of harvest, first say, peace be to this house. It's the purpose for going. This is the purpose for going into to do the work of the harvest. Our work is one of peace. Our work is one to help and to benefit people, not to bother people. We're not going into the fields of the, of, of the harvest to bother people or to hit them over the head with the Bible or to tell them what they're doing wrong. Jesus said the work is peaceable. It's the reason why we go into the harvest. It's for their good, not for their harm. And it's not for our good. It's for their good. What do I mean it's not for our good? It's not for our good so that we can get more members and get more offering. No, that's not for our good. It's for their good. Go and say, peace be to this house, their house. The work is peaceable. It's not to bother them. In fact, oftentimes when you think about taking the three angels' message, God's last day warning, preparation message that he says has to go to every nation, kindred, tribe, tongue, and people. It's that specific last day warning message that God has commissioned to Seventh-day Adventists to share with the world, the everlasting gospel. Part of that last day everlasting gospel message, or guess what? Some testing truths. Some, some testing truths that when people understand it, God will make a change in their thinking. God will make a change in their actions. He will make a change in their hearts. It's part of the last day three angels everlasting gospel message. But the fact is that the work is for their good. It's peaceable. It's not for their harm. And when people learn new truths, sometimes I've heard people say this to me. I've heard people say, what right do we have to go and tell somebody about, let's say for example, the seventh day Sabbath. Don't you know that when we tell them that, that's going to turn their life upside down. They're going to have issues that will come up if we tell... It, why, why would we want to go ruin their lives like that? No! Jesus says this is for their good. It's not for their harm. Peace be to this house, not burden, and now you've got to know something to the... Do you see the difference? That's not the right way to, to look at going into the fields of harvest. Peace be to this house. In fact, when you learn new truth from the Bible, when you learn and understand God's last day three angels' message, look what Jesus says here in Luke 10, verse 23. He turned him unto his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that you see. Blessed are the eyes that see. You could say this, when other people see and understand the things that you see and understand, there's a blessing in it for them. It's for their good. Peace be unto them. It's a blessing. It's not a curse. You know, when I first learned about the three angels' message, and let's just take another for instance, another for example. When I first learned that um, God says in, the, in scriptures, there are some things that are to be considered food, and there are some things that are to be not considered food. <laughs> Did you know that God tells us what's food and what's not food in the Bible? My first reaction when I first learned about what God says is food and what God says is not food, my first reaction was, oh no, what do I have to learn that for? And I need to come back to what Jesus says, blessed are the eyes when they see the things that you see. When God is using you to share and, you, and people understand his word, God says, it's for their good, it's not for their bad, it's not for their harm. New truth even, when God brings change about into our lives and into our hearts, it's for a blessing. It's for our good, it's not for a curse. Maybe today, someone here today is struggling with something that God has put his finger on and he's put conviction on your heart on something. It's for your good. It's not to for your harm. Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. Peace be unto this house. That's what God intends for us. We all struggle with that. We're all human. 
We all have selfish, carnal nature. And we sometimes have to wrestle with when God touches something in our lives. But when we keep it in the context of his great, amazing love at the cross, then there's nothing that he's going to lead us to that's for our harm or for our bad. It's all for our good. Do you believe that? Do you believe God knows what's best for you more though than you know what, what you think is best for you? He does. Jesus says this work is peaceable. Which leads me to verse 6 here. We're still on the same first point. The work is peaceable. Luke 10 verse 6. If the son of peace be there. Okay, you go to the house and you say peace be unto this house. If the son of peace, Jesus, if the son of peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. You see, he wants that experience to be shared with others so that they can have and know and understand that peace, that presence of Jesus, God in their lives too. The peace shall rest upon it. But if not, not everybody's going to choose to accept it. And if not, if they choose to reject it, what does Jesus say next in verse 6? It shall turn to you again. Why does Jesus say that? Have you ever tried to share the love of Jesus, the love of God with somebody and they've rejected it? And they said, no, thank you. And the, the normal thing then is that not only will they reject the message, oftentimes they will reject the messenger. And how does that feel when that happens? You've had it happen. I've had it happen. It doesn't feel good. Jesus is saying not everybody's going to accept it. But when they don't, when they reject, then that peace that you're offering them, Jesus says, I'm going to send it back upon you so that you don't get discouraged in the work of the fields of the harvest. So that you don't get discouraged and weighed down and feel like a loser and you feel like, oh, I've blown it. And you want to just give up and not continue in the fields of harvest. Jesus said, oh, that peace is designed to come back upon you. And this is such an important point for me because if anyone struggles with this, it's me. We need to understand that if the people we're working for want what God is offering them, they will have it. They will experience it for themselves and it will affect them positively and influence them for heaven. And if they don't want it, and if they do not want the son of peace that is being offered, then Jesus says, don't let that rejection rob you of your peace. Does, does that make sense? Don't let it rob you of your peace if they say no to the peace of God that's being offered. It will return to you. Don't lose peace if others reject God's offer. So for Jesus to say that implies, this implies that he doesn't want us to be discouraged while we're working for him. He wants us to always, always experience the joy of working side by side with him in the fields of harvest. Otherwise, we're going to get discouraged and weighed down and it becomes a burden. And I told you, I've told you this before, if anyone struggles with this, it's me. Every time we do an evangelistic, a prophecy series or seminar, and it never fails, people come, we invite people to come, we send out invitations, people come and they begin studying night after night, and usually at the beginning of the series of meetings, everybody, oh yeah, this is great, we love studying God's word, this is wonderful, but then we begin to study the points of the three angels' message, and they begin to learn some things, testing truths. And what, what usually happens when people get to that point? If they want what God is offering, the peace of God remains with them. But there are those who will reject. And they will say, no thank you. And they will stop coming. And if I'm doing the speaking, or if I'm even there working at, at the, the meetings with the people, trying to encourage the people to keep coming, and, and they, stop, they choose to stop coming, I just know how that makes me feel. And my wife knows how that makes me feel. And that's why I'm so thankful to, to now, I, I've recently come across this verse, and that's why I'm spending so much time on this verse. I don't want you to, to get discouraged, like I have had a tendency to do. It shall turn to you again. I love that. I just love that. He doesn't want us to be discouraged and to quit working with him in the fields of harvest. There was a missionary once who got so discouraged that... God, you've let me down. Nothing is happening. The people are rejecting. I have not had anyone interested in anything that I've shared for you. You've forsaken me. And he was so distraught with God 
that he was out wandering through the wilderness and he came across the cave. He didn't know the cave was there. He went into this cave. He went into the farthest, darkest recesses of this cave and he sat down. It was dark in there and he just there angry at God because everyone had been rejecting all the hard work that he'd been putting into sharing the love of God with others. Nobody was interested and God had forsaken him. And while he's sitting there in the darkness of this cave, he hears a noise off to the left. And his eyes had adjusted now to the darkness a little bit. And as he turns and looks, sitting within reach, he could have touched it, was a mother hyena with her pups. And they say there's nothing more ferocious, nothing more vicious than a mother hyena who would protect and defend her pups. And there she was, sitting right there. She could have ripped him to shreds. And when he realized that he was sitting next to a mother hyena with her cubs, he very gently got up and began to walk out of the cave. And when he got back out into the daylight, he realized something. God, you hadn't forsaken me. You just saved my life. God, you were with me the whole time. I didn't even realize it. And it dawned on him. God, I've lost my peace. I didn't follow through with what you promised here in Luke 6. Let me flip back to it again. If the son of peace be there, your peace will rest upon it. But if not, it shall turn to you again. And the missionary had to say in prayer, Lord, give me that peace back. I'm sorry that I've lost it. Have you lost your peace today? Is there something in your life today that has discouraged you so much to the point that you've gotten so down? Maybe today you've come dragging yourself into church today. God says, listen, I don't want you to lose your peace. Whatever it is that's caused you to lose that, God says, I will send it to you again. It will return to you again. Accept it by faith again just now. Nobody has to leave here today without it. I will give it to you again. Luke 10 verse 7 also says this. Still on the same point, the work is peaceable. Luke 10 verse 7, And in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. Now, we already looked at this verse in the context of the work is scary because if you remember a few weeks ago I mentioned what's scary about this well it's scary if you're going to someone's house in the fields of harvest and they invite you to stay for dinner and you sit down and Jesus says when they serve food to you he says eat it but what if they want me to eat fried green tomatoes Lord that is scary for me what if they want me to eat eggplant I don't think I can Jesus says eat it you eat what's set before you now again he's talking in the context of eating food not that that much is not food. But anyway, the point for today from this verse is we need to accept their works of kindness. We need to let them be involved in the ministry right away. Let them be involved in the ministry. Accept their works of kindness. Let them minister to you because the whole point is Jesus says go make disciples. Don't go make church members. Go make disciples. Help them to understand that they can be a part of this amazing work as well. Okay. That's point one for today. Point two for today. The work is greater than us. Here it is. Luke 10, verse 8 and 2. The work is greater than us. And into whatsoever city you enter and they receive you, heal the sick that are therein. And say to them, the kingdom of God is come nigh to you. The work is greater than us. How can I do that? Heal the sick? I can't do that. This job description is getting more and more difficult all the time. It's impossible. Jesus says, go and heal the sick. Can't do it. How do you do it? So the very next thing Jesus says immediately on the hills of you go and heal the sick, the next thing he says is what? The kingdom of God has come near you. He tells you how it happens. You cannot do it, but the kingdom of, co of God has come near to you. It's a reminder that it's all his work. It's not our work. Do you see that? Go heal the sick. Impossible. What do you mean? You want me to heal? I can't heal anybody. No, you can't. You see, but you need to understand the kingdom of God has come near you. God is near you. It's his work. You're the conduit by which God is going to do the miraculous. It's a totally different way of looking at things when we see that God and his kingdom is with us. And it's the principles of a different world that we're working under. I want you to note something here. And all the things here in Luke chapter 10. For example, we don't have enough people to do the work. We, we, how, how are we going to do it? Jesus says do it. You know, we can have all kinds of excuses not to go into the fields of harvest. For example, we don't have enough money. We don't have enough resources to do the work. Jesus actually talks about that here in Luke chapter 10. But he says, 
go do it. But it's dangerous and it's scary like lambs in the midst of wolves. Jesus says, do it. No sandals for my feet? That's going to hurt. I, my, my feet will hurt. Jesus says, do it. Even if it doesn't feel good, do it. Being rejected? Nobody likes being rejected. You mean some people are going to not accept what we offer? Jesus says, do it. Eat things that my taste buds don't like? Jesus said, do it. Heal the sick? But I can't. I don't have the power to do it. Jesus says, do it because the kingdom of God is near you. He's with you. God is using us to bring his kingdom near to other people. Bringing the kingdom of heaven near to others. It's how the kingdom of heaven operates. And this is what makes the doing of the work of the harvest fun. This is what makes it exciting because you know you can't do it, but you see God does it. For example... And he spoke to Zechariah, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. If the work was not greater than us, we wouldn't even need the Holy Spirit to, do, to be with us, would we? If it wasn't greater than us, we wouldn't even need the Holy Spirit. There was a man one day who came to a point in his life, he had, he had been an alcoholic, and he came to a point in his life where he realized he wanted something better. And someone had left a track about the love of Jesus. And he read that track. And God began to do a miraculous work in his heart. And his family in time began to realize something has happened. He's not the same man anymore. And it wasn't long before he was off totally of the alcohol. And began going to church with his wife and his children. And but some of his old former drinking buddies came back around to him and he says, come on, you can't believe all that crazy stuff in the Bible. You don't really believe all those miracles in the Bible, do you? For example, you don't really believe that Jesus took the water and turned it into wine, do you? And the man looked at his friends and he said, well, I absolutely do believe that Jesus turned that water into wine because he took my wine and he turned it into water. And if he can do that for me, he can do anything. He took my wine, turned it to water. Why couldn't he take water and turn it into wine? He took my life and he changed me for the better. He could do the same for you too, brother. He could do the same thing for you too, sister. But we are not able to do the work. The work is greater than any of us. God's the one that provides the miraculous power. The work is of the utmost importance. Third point for today, Luke 10, verses 10 through 15. The work is of the utmost importance. We find that in these five, six verses here, Luke 10, 10 to 15, just a summation of them. Into whatever city you enter and they receive you not. There it is again, rejection. Go your ways and say, even the very dust of your city which cleaves to us, we do wipe off against you. And be sure of this, that the kingdom of God is come nigh to you. That's what they're rejecting. I say that it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. In other words, the work of the harvest is of the utmost importance. We're dealing with issues of life and death. Maybe you've come today and you're wondering, do I want to be a part of this or not? Do I want to accept what God is offering in my life or not? It's of the utmost importance. It really is. It's a matter of eternal life and it's a matter of eternal death. Not everybody will choose to accept, but praise God, he gives us all the opportunity to accept. Praise God that he has blessings and peace and the help that we desperately need to fill the voids and the hurts and the emptiness in our hearts. It's still available for us all. And as we experience it, if we accept it, then God says, now I'll use you to help others understand and that they can accept it too. But the work is of the utmost importance. This isn't something that is just take it or leave it. This is something that, especially at the time of the harvest, God says, don't be an unwise son who sleeps during the time of the harvest. We're dealing with eternal issues here. Who is it that they're rejecting when they reject what God is offering? Luke 10, 16, he that hears you, hears me. He that despises you, despises me. So who are they rejecting? Jesus, is it really important then to accept when God offers? Absolutely. God offers, and it's up to us to choose. Will I accept it? Or will I reject it? But isn't it helpful to see how intently interested all heaven is 
to want to make it available to everyone. Us here today included. How intently burdened the, the forces of heaven are for the people on planet earth. They are burdened and saying, please would you just accept what we're offering. The work is of the utmost importance. It was that way in Noah's day. Jesus said at the time of the harvest, at the end of the world, he said, and just as it was in the days of Noah, it's going to be that exact same way when I come back the second time. And if we're living in the last days before the second coming of Jesus, there's something just as urgent, the up, a message of the utmost importance, just as it was in Noah's day. The utmost importance is the message that says, if you accept it, God will, will save you. If you reject it, there's only one alternative. You will be lost and left behind. The message, the work of the harvest, is of the utmost importance. I had no idea where the Isle of Man was. I heard this story about the Isle of Man. Little tiny island between Great Britain and Ireland. There's Ireland to the left and Great Britain. Or, um, the, well, the whole thing is Great Britain. It's England to the right, Ireland to the left, Scotland is to the north. And that little red dot there in the middle it's called the Isle of Man. At one point in time, long ago, in the Isle of Man, there was a very popular governor, but he had an enemy who had, had influence in high places. And the enemy trumped up charges against the popular governor of the Isle of Man, complained to the king, and the king signed an, a decree saying that the governor was to be executed because he believed the message, the, the, the false message of the enemy. But the people, when they discovered what, the, what was going on, their governor had been placed in this tower. He was placed in that tower until the day of his execution was to come. And so they sent the, the, the representatives to the king and they said to the king, please, it's not true. He's a good man. We love him. He's faithful and he's loyal to you. And the king realized what had happened. So the king took his pen and, his, and he wrote the pardon for the governor who is being held in that tower on the Isle of Man wrote out the pardon and he gave it to a trusted servant and he said please take this back to the Isle of Man to put a stop to the execution no one knows what happened but the servant never showed up with the message he never showed up with the the pardon and the well-liked faithful loyal governor held in that tower on the Isle of Man was executed because the message never arrived the pardon was never received the work of the harvest in the last days is of the utmost importance and the fourth one for today and we're done the work is an amazing experience it's an amazing experience Luke 10 verse 17 and the 70 when those 70 came back the 35 pairs came back when they returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. The work is an amazing experience. Listen, was it a good experience for them when they came back? They went out into the fields of harvest. Jesus warned them there was going to be obstacles. He warned them there was going to be rejection. He warned them even that demons were going to be out there fighting against them. But when they came back, was it a good experience for them? It says they came back with joy, doesn't it? Did they see things happen that they knew they could not have possibly done? Absolutely. Did they know where the power came from when they were out in the fields of harvest? Absolutely. They knew it wasn't them that did the work. They knew it was the power of God. They saw what the name of Jesus did when they used that name, especially when they were confronted by the demons. But do you think that when they came back, after they had done their very first missionary trip out into the fields of harvest, and now they come back to Jesus, do you think that everything went smooth as glass? Do you think everything went just perfectly fine without any problems, without any setbacks, without any obstacles, without any rejection? Do you think, do you think they didn't have at least one door slammed in their face? Jesus told them that they would. But when they came back, what did they talk about? They didn't talk about all the things that, went, that, that, that were, were bad. They talked only about the great things that they saw God do. And they came back with joy. I think that's an, an amazing lesson for us to keep in mind. If we're going to be a part working the fields of harvest with Jesus, 
what are we going to focus on? Are we going to focus on the negative or are we going to praise God for the positive? What do we tend to talk about today? What do we tend to put our minds on today? Do we tend to focus more on the unpleasant things of life or do we tend to look for the ways we can praise God for the good things that He's doing? When we go to work in the fields of harvest, there's going to be the setbacks. There's going to be the negative. It's a given. Jesus said it was going to be a given. But there's going to be the good, and we can choose to focus on that too. We can praise God, and we can keep it so that our joy is not robbed, and we can keep the peace that God wants us to have, and we can continue with the Lord's work in the fields of harvest. It's amazing to me that there's not even one mention in scriptures of the disciples complaining about even one negative thing that happened. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but in my mind, I, I, would, I would say in my mind that they must have had some things happen that weren't always pleasant. But they came back with joy. They knew that they were going into the fields of harvest when they went and they knew that they were being a part of spiritual warfare when they went. They knew that demons were going to be working against them when they went. But they went and they pressed on and they never gave up. It was all because it's harvest time. Jesus was about to come to those cities and they had a work to do to prepare the people for the coming of Jesus. And it's the exact same way for us today. Today it's harvest time. It really is. And if this verse applies ever, if it ever applied, it applies to now. He that gathers in summer. We've come full circle now. We've come all the way back to the beginning. He that gathers in summer is a wise son, but he that sleeps in harvest is a son that causes shame. Romans 13 again, full circle. Must be time to end, huh? Knowing the time that now it's high time. Awake out of sleep. If you came drowsy and, and got a little sleepy, that boom must have waken you up for the, for the final end, the pill at the end. And don't feel bad if you did get drowsy today. I always like to tell people I'd rather you come to church and sleep than stay home and sleep. So come. But now that you're awake because of that, thank you, Lord. <laughs> it's time for us to realize that Jesus coming is near. And if it's not us who's going to be a part of the harvest work, then who is it? And if it's not now, then when are we going to do it? It's harvest time now, more so than ever before. And here's the summation of what we found in Luke 10. The work is all-inclusive. The work is scary. The work is doable. The work is peaceable today. The work is greater than us. The work is of the utmost importance. And the work is an amazing experience. Come to Jesus today. Make your decision to say, Yes, Lord, here am I. Send me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for caring enough about us that all heaven is a, a, a blaze in trying to get the message of your last day, everlasting gospel to every nation, kindred, tribe, tongue, and people. And I pray that every one of us here today, Lord, will at this point now say, yes, I want to accept what you are offering for me. Thank you for giving it to me, Lord. And now I also want to take the next step of faith and say, use me, Lord, here am I. Send me whatever you want me to do for you in these last days in the fields of harvest. Let's go. I thank you for giving us that call today. And I thank you for hearing and answering our prayer now as we give our lives to you anew at the end of this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing song, number 633, should be on the screen. 633.